who teaches at Stanford University's Continuing Studies program. He also leads a problem-solving workshop at Ohio State University, their business school. And uh, he regularly speaks and leads workshops, um, generally speaking, on lean product and process development. And uh, he's going to talk about lean and uh, productivity and information overload and all that good stuff today. And, uh, you know, he had slides before, but then after a close presentation, he got rid of them. And, just kidding, no slides. Jared actually stole my joke. That's how it's in the book. You know, Jared called me about a month and a half ago. I said, would you like to, would you speak here? And I said, terrific. And I'm working on my presentation. And then he finally puts up the agenda a week and a half ago. And I see him after Cliff. So I promptly threw it all out. And I said, I'll just work off of some notes. Well, I will let you get started with that. From now on, I'm going to have to Cliff at the end of the day, right? First, he puts me in front of Cliff, after Cliff. And then he takes my jokes. So as, as Jared mentioned, uh, I, what really interests me is the application of lean manufacturing ideas to information and to office work. How, how many people are familiar with lean? Uh, most people. Great. I won't have to go too deeply into it then. Uh, I, although I will say that lean, uh, you, know, you sometimes hear lean and mean put into sentences. And a friend of mine said lean is often misconstrued to mean less employees are needed. And that's not it at all. Of course. Um, typically, of course, lean has been applied to factories and to manufacturing. Increasingly, we're seeing it uh, applied to offices, to administrative functions. Uh, it's uh, really gaining a lot of traction in healthcare. I'm interested in lean as it relates to information flow in any sort of organization. And from my perspective, and from a lean perspective, information overload, I think, is a symptom of a non-lean system. It's a symptom of malorganization. It's a symptom of uh, unclear service level agreements. It's a symptom of, uh, of, of fundamental problems in the way work is structured. To me, information overload is a symptom. And there are root causes. And one of the things that you do in lean is try to understand the root causes. The tools and the concepts and the principles that lean organizations use, I think, can be used to help reduce the pernicious effects of and even eliminate information overload. So I want to tell you three stories, and if I have enough time, even four stories, about ways in which companies have used some, of, some lean concepts to help reduce the cognitive burden of information overload. Are people familiar with the concept of standard work? All right, standard work in the lean world uh, is the defined by the people actually doing work. It's not designed by Frederick Winslow Taylor coming in and saying, okay, stand here and do this and do that. It's defined by the people doing the work and it represents the current understanding of the best way to do something. It's very important, it's the current understanding we think this is the best way based on what we know now. We may change it, we may improve it, but if anyone makes the changes and improvements, it's you because you're the one doing the job and you know it best. Virtually everyone has seen in or organizations where uh, it's every day is a blizzard of emails, right? People are overloaded with emails, they're coming at you all the time, you're looking at emails constantly, you're, you're trying to see what's happening, you're afraid that you're gonna miss important information. Perhaps you have got IM systems in your office, Yahoo Chat or Google Chat or whatever, and you're getting text messages and IMs, you're getting emails, you're getting phone calls, you're getting people dropping by your office. In general, of course, uh, people of most, the thing that's used most commonly that I've seen is email, and everything is shoveled into one communication medium, email. Everything from the IRS is about to do an audit of our biggest customer, maybe we should help them out. Two, there's leftover brownies in the break room. Okay, that may be really important, right? But the idea being that everything is put through there and it, irrespective of the urgency, irrespective of the complexity, irrespective of the importance of the message. There's no standard work for how to communicate. Think about it. There's no standard work. You walk into the office, first day on the job, you're in day six, Trisha. Uh, I just learned that. She's in day six, you walk in and you're given a desk, a phone, a computer, maybe you got a Blackberry and they say, go get him, Tiger. How do we communicate here? I don't, just, you just make it up. 
And actually, Cliff, to your point, right? No one teaches us how to use PowerPoint. They you, here here's some templates. And by the way, you can you know it shows you that it's 24 point at the top and 18 and 16 and 14. Is that right? Who knows? There's no standard. I worked with a company, uh, the engineer, the R&D group at a medical device manufacturer. The engineers, these were senior engineers, they were spending six to seven hours a day in meetings and looking at email, which is not exactly why they got into engineering. They got into engineering because they really like to solve problems. And they were frustrated because the only time they had to solve problems and do cool engineering stuff was at nights and on weekends. And they were frustrated, they were burned out, they were overwhelmed, and they said, Christ, I feel like I'm shackled to this Blackberry. So we, cre we created standard work around communications. And they did it, actually. I was just sort of facilitating. And they created a three by three matrix. On one matrix, you had complexity. On one matrix, you had urgency. Complexity and urgency. What communication medium are we going to use for information that is very complex or highly urgent? Not email. They de determined that if something is really urgent, it's got to be done face to face or it has to be done by phone. Cell phone, they, they chose actually cell phone. And the same with things that were very complex because most people, and I was an English major in school by the way, most people are terrible writers and even if you're a really good writer, most people when it comes to email are terrible readers. They get distracted, they skim through things. Email is not a good communication medium for very complex topics. So if it's complex, it's got to be done face to face. If it's urgent, it must be done face to face or by cell phone. And as you move farther down, you can move to a desktop phone, could be for some things that are complex but not terribly urgent. And then eventually when you have non-complex, very simple things and non-urgent communication, that could be done via email. Sounds pretty simple. Sounds pretty obvious, but no one had an agreement here. There was no standard work until they decided this. Once they had that agreement, they could turn off their Blackberries. Either literally or metaphorically, they could put it away and say, I'm now doing some cool engineering. I'm going to work on this because I know that anything that comes into my email, in, it comes via email, it's not important. Or it's not urgent, and if it's really, if it's really big, someone will find it. And that was an enormous improvement for them. It reduced their email burden by that 40% based on their own measurements. Standard work for communication. Does that make sense? Feel free, by the way, I'm, I'm gonna keep talking, so feel free to jump in with questions or comments. I have a question. Please, sir. Could they keep to that? So they've done an ideal system. Could they, could they add here to comply? They did. The one fly in the ointment. Uh, the question, by the way, if you couldn't hear, was uh, what was the adherence like? Were they able to stick with it? And the answer is yes. Uh, as of uh, eight months later, they were still doing it. The one fly in the ointment or the one compl added complexity is that we did this within this one division. This was the, R the engineering group, with the R&D group. Sales wasn't necessarily on board with this. I mean, it's a big company. They've got 10,000 people. And so you have to start getting everyone to see the world in the same way. And that creates some complexity. Uh, but I think what was, very, was really powerful is that rather than it being dictated from above, uh, someone earlier, was it Victoria, mentioned you know, someone saying, all right, we're going to be no email from 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock, or you know, uh, one subject per email, whatever, where it's dictated from above. This was determined and decided and developed by the people doing the work, by the people in the system. And so, it was theirs, they owned it. And so they were very happy to accept it because it wasn't imposed externally. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was just thinking about the customer questions as well. What do you mean by the customer well, questions? external people are emailing you about urgent stuff and they don't know the rules. Right, so what happens if external people who, don't, who weren't part of the meeting email you? Um, in general, if something is really urgent, and if I'm being audited by the IRS, for example, I might send an email to my accountant, and then I would absolutely call and say, hey, the IRS is descending upon me, well, get over here. I have never seen 
I mean, there, there's a reason why <laughs> there's a reason why when the, when uh, when you have a fire at your house, you don't you don't have an e direct email line to the fire department. You have a you know you got 911, you've got you've got levers, you've got sirens. Nothing ever goes. Nothing urgent. 99.999% of the time goes via email, and if it does, it's followed up with some other kind of communication. And I think it's important as well to, we want to solve the, the Pareto principle, let's take care of the 80 or the 90%, and we can manage, we can figure out some workaround for the very few exceptions. Okay, next tool I want to talk about. This comes from, again, Lean. Lean has a, is based on what they call 5S. And I won't bore you with the five Japanese words that it stands for, but basically it's a place for everything and everything in its place. You see this in factories. Uh, if you do the Alcatraz tour, actually, you can see it there. It's a shadow board, for example. In the kitchen, they use the shadow board at Alcatraz, where all the knives had, were matched up with shadows, and this was a very quick way for the guards to tell whether, in fact, all the knives were present and accounted for, and if not, they knew they were in trouble. And you see this in factories, there are pegboards and shadow boards, so you know where the pliers go and the wrenches go and the screwdrivers grow. In an information environment, in an, uh, in an office, 5S is often misconstrued. People start putting tape outlines around staplers, which is silly, of course, because no one's ever lost a stapler, or not usually, or a phone. For me, and from my perspective, 5S, a place for everything and everything in its place, is for information. How can you organize information so that it is immediately, or nearly immediately, retrievable and accessible? The nurses at the Covenant Healthcare System in Texas were frustrated. This goes back about two years, maybe three years ago. They were spending 6.1 hours out of every 12-hour shift filling out paperwork. <laughs> More than 50% of their day was spent filling out paperwork. And I don't know if you know any nurses, but I, uh, I do, and I have not met a single nurse who said, I want to go into this field of nursing because there's nothing I like more than filling out forms. And they said, this is insane, leaving aside the fact that we're not creating any value for our patients, leaving aside the fact that it is fundamentally uh, soul-deadening and uninspiring and frustrating. Uh, this is just a horrible waste. They're also generating 2.2 million pieces of paper a year. 2.2 million pieces of paper, one hospital system. So they did 5S on all of the forms they used. What they found was that sometimes their signatures would go in the lower right corner, sometimes in the lower left, sometimes in the middle, sometimes in the upper part, sometimes the patient name was here, sometimes the patient treat diagnosis was here, sometimes it was here. Everything was all over the place. There were duplicative forms. There were redundant forms. There were forms that contradicted each other. There was no organization to the information at all. And as they watched themselves do the work, what they saw was that they were spending five seconds, 10 seconds, each form, just trying to figure out what the hell it is they were looking at and where the information they needed was. They redesigned the forms, and they reduced the amount of time they spent working on paperwork from 6.1 hours to three hours. A 50% improvement. To, without adding any new nurses, now all of a sudden these guys were able to spend more time doing what they were being really paid to do, help care for patients. If you think about the electronic and paper forms in the offices in which you work, the templates, the forms, the structure, oftentimes you'll see that nothing, things are not clear. And people spend a lot of time trying to figure out where the relevant information is that either they need to extract or they need to input. That's how 5S can be applied to information and not just to a factory. Comments, thoughts on that? Yeah. Of laughing in the corner here because we're British and uh, you know we have a national health system whereas you know you don't have so much paperwork because there isn't so many so much concern and control about 
payment and all the rest of it. But uh, and I'm not an ethnographer, it just never really occurred to me, but you're absolutely right. There's a huge amount of uh, potential design improvement that could be done. I mean, if we only just look at how um, we design our information frameworks or our workflows, because there's so much in it that's just really, I think it was designed, you know, from a rational actor perspective, it made sense for the individual who was designing it at the time, but nobody has stepped back and really looked at this as a, a system of, as you said, you know, conflicting or sometimes, uh, you know, redundant sort of pieces of information. I know this, I'm notorious at work because I constantly, when I see a form that I just don't, I think it shouldn't be there, I'll actually fill in the form, you know, this is a ridiculous process, why are we doing this? <laughs> Um, because we, there's so many of them, they, and they proliferate. And I've been told by people in the organisation, we do it because it's the law, or you know, we have to do it. And these are like pe reasons that people just make up. I don't, they, they don't, I don't know why they, they keep doing these processes this way. It's amazing. One issue, and Cliff, I'll come to you in one second. Uh, one issue with the form design, and what, again, electronic or paper it doesn't really matter, is that. Oftentimes, the different steps in the value stream in the process haven't spoken to each other. So I've designed a form that works very, very well for me as I'm talking to you, the customer, I'm writing down name, things like this. And then it gets handed off to you. And your job is to take this information and manipulate it, put it in some place. But the work that you have to do does not match up with the way the information is entered. And, you, and the reason is that you and I have never spoken. In fact, you've never seen what I do with the information. You work on the second floor, I work in the fifth floor, or I work in the other building, or I work in another country. Makes sense for me, doesn't make sense for you. And I'm actually walking through if you staple yourself to the information and go through the process, what you often see is what makes sense for person A makes no sense for person B. Cliff, you had a question or point, comment? Sounds, sounds like so the redesign of those forms would be a top-down, I mean, so somebody, the, if it's for the whole organization, right, then somebody in the senior leadership would mm -hmm. say, let's do this. Right. Well, you would, it well, doesn't have to be from the same. So that was my question just about that relation. I mean, it sounds almost in your, what you were just describing is an iterative process, right? Where there's, you're, you're you know, putting something together, but then testing it in the field and then having that feedback. But it sounds to me like, just in my experience too, like when I might teach this method with a group at a company, at a big company, you know, the, the group might be excited about it, and then they, they do something, you know, innovative, and then they show it to their boss's boss, and they say, well, we don't like that, go back to the old way. So they, there seems to be a big bumping up against, you know, the top down saying, you know, well, we don't want that. And it sounds like yeah. almost there's like an iterative, you know, we need to look at this as an organization, but there also needs, it needs to be an iterative process. Is that right? Yes, it does. Need, it is an iterative process, but I would argue that a, a, a lean organization, which doesn't necessarily mean that you have to make cars like Toyota, but rather it's an organization that's dedicated to continuous improvement, solving problems, eliminating waste, and actively engaging the talents and expertise and knowledge of its employees. If senior leadership is talking about how forms are designed, that company's got much bigger problems. Uh, in the case of the Covenant Healthcare System, they, the, the people who wanted to make the change were the nurses. And the nurses were working with physicians, because of course they, they, they were, it was all part of the, the physicians were handling it, the accounting people, the billing people were all touching these things. So everyone had to be involved. Top management's involvement was to say, let's improve this process because you're spending 50% of your time doing non-value added activities. As long as you are compliant with the law, as long as you're not <coughs> violating laws, jeopardizing patient safety, have at it. And they, they got involved sort of, when there would be check-ins where we'd say, this is what we're doing. And they would say, great, sir, keep going. And I think that the, if, if management is getting involved at that level, and I, I realize I sound Pollyannish, <laughs> in a perfect world, management is focused on vision and they leave the, you know, the other stuff to, to, to us little people. Um, but I think that in, in, in a healthy organization, management says, let's fix these problems. We want to improve the, reduce the waste and improve the amount of value we're creating for our customers. Go get them. And let us know what problems we can help you solve, as opposed to saying, we don't like the fact that you're doing this in this direction, in this way. Jerry gave me the five-minute sign, so if you don't mind, I'll 
happily answer questions after the five. Um, I want to talk about the next, uh, next tool is visual management. Visual management is very, very big and lean. The idea being that you want to make a process and the status of a process immediately visible. Is it in control? Is it in, is it in order? Or is it not in order? Are there any abnormalities? That making things visible actually fights against the trends of technology, which is to turn everything physical into bits and bytes and bury it deep within your computer. There was a group of pathologists at, the, at a hospital, in a cancer center in New York City, and they spent information overload, they spent an enormous amount of time fielding phone calls from referring physicians. The referring physician would call someone up and say, Cliff, what's the status on Mrs. Gonzalez? It, is it cancer or is it not cancer? And if you've ever been to a pathologist's office, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, there's piles and piles and piles of slides, physical slides, not, not, not slide handouts like a PowerPoint. Physical slides, these things are not readable from the outside. It's not like each one on the binder says Mrs. Gonzalez, Mrs. Johnson, Mr. Smith. And so I get a phone call from, from, from Cliff, and now I'm starting to I say, OK, hold on a minute. Let me stop reading a case that I'm reading. And I'm looking all over the place to find out whether her case, has, what the disposition is on her slides. Turns out that they're not in my office anymore. Turns out that I sent them back to the lab for some new stains and some more, more samples. It takes me 10 minutes to figure that out. In the meantime, Cliff may have hung up, and now I have to call him back or send him an email, and so we go back and forth and back and forth. There's a lot of information overload. So what we did for them was create a very simple visual management system, high tech, a whiteboard and post-it notes. And we had, if any of you are familiar with Jim Benson's personal Kanban, we had slides to read in one column on the left, so we, all the, the patient's names or patient numbers. We had um, status and completed. And each patient was visible on a post-it note, and it would say things like, off to the lab. I think actually they modified it and actually created a sent back to the lab for, for more tests. So I could, if you called me, I'd be able to say, oh yeah, Ms. Gonzalez, she's back at the, uh, her, her slides are back at the lab. I'm waiting two days for another stain. Done. Thank you very much. Information overload. As opposed to having to look through the system, the computer system, type in her, her her, uh, her medical record number to see if I can find out where the thing is. Visual management helps make things easier. I want to tell you one more story. Uh, actually, no, since I'm almost out of time, I'm going to end. Two minutes. Two minutes. So what I'd like to do is, those are three ideas. Visual management, standard work, and 5S. How they can help reduce the design of the system, can help reduce the burdens, the scourge of information overload. And with that, I'll shut up and ask for some more questions or comments. There was a question back there, I think. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Sorry, I was multitasking. No, that's fine. Uh, well, I wanted to say that you know, having Six Sigma or any process implemented, um, if it's not done without governance and change, it never really works. So, I'd love to say something about you know, the way you are approaching it, so do you actually incorporate those two things in your design? I'm sorry, I don't, under, I don't fully understand the question. Well, one is to change the forms and like bring a new system in. Yeah. And communicating that change, so do you build <coughs> the change into the design philosophy that you have? Do I, do I communicate, do I bring, I'm sorry, do I communicate the change? Yeah, we have to like say a thousand people get affected. So there has to be a change management process to communicate that change. The representatives from each group involved in the change are there to the, the, the people that are that are that are being affected are involved in the change itself. And so the cha change management is much 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 easier when the people being changed are actually making the change themselves as opposed to having it imposed upon them. Because what, ha what you're having, having now is that people are, being, are engaged in solving a problem. The nurses say, gee, we would like to spend less than six hours a, uh, a day working on doing our paperwork. And everyone else is feeling the same thing. Great, let's all figure out how to do it together. Change management is much, much easier then. Now, obviously not every nurse was involved. Not every billing person was involved. But representatives from billing were. 
And once one of my team is representing me, I'm willing to go along with it, as opposed to saying, oh, God, those people down the hall, they made those changes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so we're, uh, we're done. Thank you very much.